I want to welcome each one of you, my brothers and sisters, for a Bible study on uh, the first lesson, the Sabbath school lesson on Ezra and Nehemiah. And it's because of God's grace and his uh, leading, we are into the last uh, quarter of this year, last three months of our Bible study. These three months, October, November and December, we are going to study together books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and going to learn a number of spiritual lessons from the history connected with uh, God's people in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So we praise God for uh, his blessing and uh, may the Lord bless us as we study this uh, Ezra and Nehemiah books during these three months. So I welcome each one of you. I request each one of you to study these two books so that uh, we can learn a number of uh, spiritual lessons to grow together in Jesus, preparing for his eternal kingdom, which is coming soon. Let's pray first. Then we'll get back to our introduction to our lesson. Loving Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for your leading and your blessing. Thank you for your written word, the Bible. As we are going to study together this quarter, books of Ezra and Nehemiah. We need your special blessing and your grace. And now we want your Holy Spirit to teach these important deeper truths in your word so that we will be prepared for your eternal kingdom which is coming soon. Lord, bless each person who is uh, watching this program and also their families. Bless those who are sharing with their friends and family members and local uh, congregations and also sharing online with their friends and well-wishers. Bless each one of us so that we can do something to glorify your name in sharing your word so that others also can be blessed. Bless us Lord today as well as in this uh, three months of uh, our Bible study each week. Because I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this quarter, our lessons were prepared by uh, a professor from uh, Andrews University in the state of Michigan. Andrews University Theological Seminary Dean. Uh, he is uh, now Jerry Muscala. Uh, whom I know personally. I met him uh, uh, several times when he visited uh, Spicer campus. So I know him personally. Uh, he is originally from Russia and very uh, dedicated student of God's word. Now he is the uh, dean, which means he is the uh, head of all the theological programs, Old Testament, New Testament, archaeology, uh, various branches of uh, the studies, he is in charge. So, uh, thank God that God uh, moved his heart to make uh, or prepare lessons on Ezra and Nehemiah. I know we haven't uh, studied as uh, believers of God for a number of years, the book of Ezra. So, that's why this is our privilege this uh, quarter, these three months, to study systematically book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, this week's uh, lesson title is Making Sense of History in uh, Jerubabel and Ezra. Now, the history which is connected with God's people, the Jewish people, we have to learn a number of spiritual lessons, a number of spiritual lessons. I know uh, this, uh, we are going to learn together in these two books how God inspired his prophets to predict some things. The prophets predicted some things. For example, Jeremiah. Then how that prediction accurately 100% fulfilled in the history. So that's why by knowing that, for example, Jeremiah predicted 
40 years before uh, they went into Babylonian captivity. 40 years before, which means from the uh, beginning of his ministry, he started telling, Babylonians are going to come. Babylonian king and army will come. They will capture you. They will take you as uh, slaves to Babylon. This temple will be destroyed. Jerusalem will be like a burial ground. Nobody is going to live here. He told these prophecies. You can read that in uh, Jeremiah, uh, the first 10 chapters. But people did not pay any attention. So the day came. King Nebuchadnezzar and his army came. And they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They took a, a number of people as slaves to Babylon. And also Jeremiah told in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 1 to 12. Babylonia, Babylonians are going to keep you as captives. You are going to serve as laborers, as slaves. For 70 years in Babylon you are going to live. But after 70 years of punishment of God because of your idol worship and your Sabbath breaking. These are the two major sins. Sabbath breaking and worshipping idols. Because of which God sent. I know there are other sins also like adultery, stealing, exploitation. Uh, now all of them together God gave them punishment through this heathen nation Babylonians. They were there 70 years. But God also told through Jeremiah chapter 25, Jeremiah 25 verse 11 and 12. After 70 years, God is going to bring them back to Jerusalem and Judah. This is what we call in English restoration. God is going to restore his people back to Jerusalem and Judah. It was predicted. It was predicted. Surely that prophetic prediction came exactly 100% true. It fulfilled in the history. That's why reading the books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, we can understand how the predicted prophecy, God foretold through prophets, then that prophecy exactly came to pass, fulfilled. So what do we learn out of that? I know today we are going to read together for the, our memory text, Ezra chapter 1 verse 2. But uh, what do we learn? When God says something in his word, the prophecy, it will surely fulfill. It will not fail. The sky may fail, earth may fail. But in God's word, not even a dot, not even a tittle, it will not fail. Every, even a small dot, if you're writing in Hebrew and Greek, then even a small dot makes a big difference. If you are... Uh, reading and understanding the languages of Hebrew, that is the Old Testament, and the Greek, which is the New Testament. But God says, not even small dot also will not fail. Everything will fulfill whatever God said. This is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, told by Jesus. That's why the prophecies about second coming will not fail, will accurately fulfill, Jesus will come. This is what the assurance we are going to receive from studying books of Ezra and Nehemiah. That's why making sense of history, how that history is meaningful to us today. What happened those days, uh, let us say something like uh, 2,600 years ago in the time of uh, Prophet Daniel, we may say, ah, that happened in those days. Now Babylon is uh, no more. But the prophecy, how it fulfills he is so much meaningful to us today because the prophecies about second king, prophecies about the end of the world, prophecies about the uh, new heaven and the new earth will also fulfill. So today with this little introduction, we are going to read that memory text or the key text from Ezra chapter 1 verse 2. These are the words of King Cyrus, a heathen king. Let's read that. <laughs> Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, 
which is in Judah. Now, I want you to see, these are the words of King Cyrus. King Cyrus was a heathen king, he was a Persian king. But he was giving a kind of a testimony or a decree, this is. This is a royal decree, king's decree uh, from uh, uh, his capital city, Shushan. And he was saying that the God of heaven, so he was honoring, he was accepting the God of the Bible. God of the Bible. He gave me all of these kingdoms. He gave me all of these uh, people to rule. So in fact, in reality, he was saying that God of the Bible made me king. Not only that, he commanded me to rebuild his temple in Jerusalem because that temple in Jerusalem, which was built by King Solomon, was destroyed by Babylonian army in 586 BC. God allowed it. God allowed it because of the Jewish people and their open sins like uh, idol worship, breaking Sabbath, adultery, stealing, all the major sins. God allowed it. But now God commanded, Cyrus uh, uh, was telling, God commanded him to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. How did the uh, Cyrus come to know? How did King Cyrus come to know that it is God who gave him the kingdom? It is God who made him the God of the Bible who made him as the king. It is that Bible God who commanded him to rebuild the temple for him in Jerusalem. How did he come to know? And the tradition tells us that when Cyrus became king in 538 BC. In late 538 BC, after the death of uh, Darius the Mede, his uncle, then he became king. When he became king, then tradition tells us. Now, Daniel, he continued him as the prime minister because it was Darius the Mede who appointed Daniel as the prime minister. Cyrus continued with Daniel as prime minister. And according to the tradition, it is Prophet Daniel, who told King Cyrus, O King, now your name is mentioned in our religious book, in our scriptures. And now God told that uh, he is going to make you king. He is going to use you as his shepherd. Then according to the tradition, uh, King Cyrus was so much amazed. And Daniel opened the book of Isaiah. And he showed him in Isaiah 45, verse 1 to 4. Especially Isaiah 45, verse 1. It says, Cyrus, my shepherd. When Isaiah wrote this book, at least 150 years in advance, that means 150 years before the birth of King Cyrus. In fact, his father also was not born at that time. And God told Cyrus, my shepherd, though he did not know me. I know him. Though, though he did not choose me, I chose him. You can read in Isaiah 45 verse 1 to 4. Then I am going to open before him all the iron and the brass gates. I am going to give him the kingdom. So when he showed that one, surely he was so much impressed according to the tradition. King Cyrus was so much impressed. My name is written here. And uh, the parents of Cyrus had no clue, no idea that there is a God in heaven. His name is Yahweh in, in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we call him Jesus. And that God now told through his prophet Isaiah that this boy is going to be named as Cyrus. They had no idea because they were not believers. They were heathen, they were Persians. But here it is. When this boy was born to them, as predicted 150 years at least before, the parents chose exactly that name Cyrus. That's why, though Bible tells about a, other, uh, a number of heathen people <laughs> whom God used, this particular person, this heathen person, God predicted him by his name. God only told this is the name. 
and his parents gave the same name though they did not know anything about this god and this religion and this scripture book can you imagine what does it tell you and me we have to learn a lesson god knows everything about the future god knows everything about the past god knows everything what is going on at present <laughs> that's why it is better to put yourself into the hands of god trust that god because he knows everything he can lead you he can bless you so when uh, cyrus saw this one he was so much impressed and also prophet daniel told him showed him from uh, isaiah isaiah chapter 44 verse 28 isaiah chapter 44 verse 28 it says and cyrus my shepherd he is going to lay the foundation and build my temple. Then when he saw this one, he was so much taken up. That's why he was telling in this royal decree recorded in chapter 1 of book of Ezra. You read Ezra chapter 1. This is the decree which king started saying, this God of heaven, that is Jesus, or they call in the Old Testament Yahweh. He is going to he is the one who gave me this kingdom. He is the one who commanded me to rebuild his temple in Jerusalem. Then that's why people who are willing to go. Now I am giving you freedom to go. I am setting you uh, free to go to Jerusalem. Then you rebuild that temple. He gave them a donation. He gave them all the vessels which King Nebuchadnezzar and army brought from Jerusalem and kept them in Babylon. He uh, gave everything. He did not take even one. He did not take even one. Maybe we have to learn a lesson. Nebuchadnezzar, though he was a heathen man, and they took all the gold and the silver vessels from Jerusalem temple. Then, they kept all of them safe. They did not melt anything. They did not use anything. Though, King Nebuchadnezzar made a big uh, golden statue, golden image in chapter 3 of book of Daniel. 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. He did not use any one of these vessels. He did not melt any one of those uh, golden vessels to be used for that uh, uh, great image or the statue. He did not. Because he knew these are the articles, vessels of uh, God's temple. I should not handle them. I should not misuse them. We have to learn a lesson. A heathen man was so cautious not to touch, not to use for his uh, own purpose those golden vessels. What about you, my brother? What about you, my sister? Are you using uh, some of the property, some of the things or the money which belong to God's temple, God's church? Using it for yourself, for your selfish purposes? God is going to ask an account if we misuse that money or his property. This is God's property. The church property. This is God's money, the offering money. This is God's money, the tithe money. We should not use it. Only we should use it for His glory, for His evangelism, for the furtherance of His cause. We should not take it or use it for your purpose or your family purpose. Let us not touch that one. And if you do that one, we cannot escape God's punishment on us and our families. That's why, surely, this heathen king gave everything back. That heathen king Nebuchadnezzar kept everything safe. This heathen king he was giving everything. Can you imagine that seven lamp golden stand? Seven lamp golden, uh, golden, golden lamps and golden stand. That itself, uh, Moses used 48 kgs of gold. One talent means 48 kgs of gold. Everything he gave it back. So literally hundreds and hundreds of cages of gold vessels, golden vessels. They gave everything. They gave everything uh, back to Jewish people to take it back to Jerusalem to be used again when the temple is reconstructed. Now we need to understand that uh, as Jeremiah told, predicted, in Jeremiah chapter 25, 1 to 11, 70 years you are going to be there as slaves, the captivity. Then you are going to come back. Then you are going to come back. So, that means you are going to be 
restored. You are going to return from that captivity. Exactly that fulfilled. That exactly uh, that prophecy fulfilled. So we have to learn a spiritual lesson. What all the prophecies we have regarding the second coming of Jesus. Sometimes we are thinking, oh, it's taking too long to be fulfilled uh, to, for Jesus to come back second time. Oh, those prophecies are going to fulfill. They will not fail. Any prophecy will not fail. They will fulfill. Then Jesus will come second time. We will go to his kingdom. So that's why surely we need to do this one. And uh, now, uh, so Cyrus gave the permission and a, a number of people went under the leadership of Jerubabel. He was the governor. Or some uh, Bibles translate as chancellor, governor. Then the spiritual leader was Joshua. He was the high priest. I want you to see another aspect. Yes, we need secular leaders to rule us. But also we need to understand we need a spiritual leader, the high priest. Now, I know there are some groups these days, they say, oh, we don't need any leader. We don't need any pastor. We can take care of ourselves. Oh, somebody has some business or have some uh, job, some government job or some private job. And in addition to that job also, some people are also leading some congregation. They're not able to give full time because whole day they have to be at work. Then when they come back, they are tired. Then of course, they do something uh, to take care of that uh, congregation. But they are not able to give the full time to visit people, to study the Bible with them and to pray with them. They don't have full time because they are working. It's only part time work. Maybe for some people, this is little extra income along with their job. Running a church is some extra income. No, don't do it for the sake of income. Yes, Paul also worked making tents, but he only made little for his survival. The rest of the whole time, more time he spent for God's work because he didn't want to be a burden to anyone. But these days, we are doing the other way around. Much of our time, whole day is for our job. Then when you come back after the uh, work in the evening, then you relax for a little while, take some rest, which we need desperately. Then uh, go and do the church work to take care of some congregation, to visit a few important people or sick people. Yes, but nothing like a full-time ministry. So that's why here Joshua was the high priest. So we need a spiritual leader. A leader to take care of, a person to take care of our spiritual needs. So they came, that is the first batch of captives who came from Babylon in 5, uh, probably 537 uh, or 38, 36 BC, 536 BC, because about 537, towards the end of 538 or uh, in 537 BC, uh, King Cyrus gave this decree saying, whoever is interested, you can go. And we are told, according to the Jewish history, 50,000, 50,000 people left Babylon under the leadership of Jerubabel and the spiritual leadership of uh, Joshua, the high priest. And they came and they laid the foundation for constructing the temple. This is what we can say a second temple. So, then, uh, when they started, what happened? Now, we want to also uh, learn some more uh, lessons. Now, these exiles or captives. So, now, when they're about to come back, before uh, King Cyrus could give a decree, Daniel fasted and prayed. Daniel was prime minister under... Darius the Mede. In Daniel chapter 9, you read, Daniel fasted with ashes and sackcloth he wore because he understood by reading book of Jeremiah. 
So this is another important lesson we have to learn, spiritual lesson. Though Daniel was prime minister, very, very important job. He did not neglect reading the word of God, reading the Bible. What about you, my brothers and sisters? I know we have uh, demanding jobs. Some of you leaders, some of you have a very important uh, now business. You have, a, let us say, challenging job or a, a high-tech job. Whatever the responsibility you have, do not neglect to read the Bible for your spiritual development, for your spiritual growth. As we need uh, food for our physical body, for our daily nourishment and uh, good health and growth, likewise we need daily reading the word of God, the Bible. Then our spiritual life will be uh, safe and sound and we can grow day by day in uh, uh, God. And also Daniel fasted and prayed. We have to learn that lesson also. Did you any time take time to fast and to pray? Because fasting prayer is the most outstanding, most powerful prayer which anybody can offer. And also fasting prayer can bring the answer for your prayer faster than any other prayer. That's what happened to Daniel. He started fasting. That day itself God sent the answer by angel Gabriel. But many times we are neglecting this fasting prayer. Sometimes some people say, oh, that is for Pentecostal people, not for us. I tell you, fasting prayer is for everyone. That's why Jesus set an example. He fasted 40 days. But he did not require you and me to do 40 days. Whenever you feel a need, I know a number of us in our own lives, we have uh, that need, the problems which we face, the families, our families face problems, our churches are facing problems and our organizations are facing problems. But we are not utilizing this powerful free gift of God, fasting prayer. Daniel did that. He was praying. What for? for his people, Jewish people, to be set free by the new government now, Medes and Persians, so that they can go back and again live in their land. That's what he was pleading with God. And surely that fulfilled within a short time because Darius the Mede worked only about one year. Then after that he died a natural death. Then comes... Uh, <laughs> Then comes uh, uh, King Cyrus. King Cyrus gave the decree. Uh, now the permission to go back. We have to also un uh, understand another important lesson. God moved the heathen king to uh, declare freedom to his people. And uh, surely Cyrus was a heathen king. He was a Persian. Later because of the association of Daniel the prophet. He became a believer. That's why he was expressing that God of heaven gave me this kingdom. Maybe we have to learn that uh, spiritual lesson, all of us. It's because of you, it's because of me. Any heathen friend or any heathen uh, neighbor or any heathen co-worker, any heathen, let us say, our neighbors did they come to know the true god through your association through your friendship through your talking see daniel whenever he got an opportunity he witnessed about his god that's why you know three kings were converted one after another one first king nebuchadnezzar was converted because of daniel's association because daniel kept telling whenever he got an opportunity to tell about the true God. He became a believer in his uh, last days. Same thing with uh, Darius the Mede. He also came to know the true God. And only he had one year opportunity to work with Daniel, then he died a natural death. Surely he became a believer. You can read that in Daniel chapter 6. And uh, he expressed the uh, faith in his uh, God, in the God of uh, Daniel. Then Cyrus, three kings, because of your association, your friendship, uh, your intervention, did any person, uh, a Gentile person, uh, are you able to lead that person to Christ? 
ask yourself. If not, try your level best during these three months so that you can do something. So that's why surely God can use a heathen person to do favor to you. I know those days as well as these days, God's people are very few, only handful. That's why we are called remnant. But heathen people are more around us in our village, in our street, in our town, in our street or in our colony, in our neighborhood. Yes, heathen people are more. And from time to time, I know we work with hidden people. We work with them in their business, in our offices, in our school, wherever you work. Or in that, uh, now wherever the company where you work, sure, in that industry. There are so many hidden people around. And from time to time, we need their help. Because some of those officials where you work, in your workplace, they're not believers. They're uh, Gentiles. They're hidden. And... You need their uh, help. You need their cooperation. God can move the hearts of the heathen people. See, God moved the heart of this heathen king Cyrus to make a favorable decree, favorable rule, favorable uh, royal, let us say, declaration, setting them free. So God can do that even now. If somebody a heathen person to help you or your children for your job, for your promotion or something you need from some of those heathen people. Yes, God can even change their heart to help you. That's what God did to those people there in the days of Daniel. The Cyrus heart was moved. That's why God can do that even now. That's why let it trust in God. Then, so these people, they went to beautify. Okay. Then in those days, in the days of uh, prophet Daniel up to Ezra. Now, uh, just we want to see overall view of those kings who existed at that time. And surely uh, Ezra chapter 4 was 1 to 7. Ezra chapter 4 verses 1 to 7. You can see the list of those kings. But all those kings are not listed according to chronological order. The names are listed, but they are not in chronological order. For example, there are some of those kings who opposed the construction of uh, God's temple, who stood as stumbling blocks. Now, the first king to uh, start with in, from the time of Daniel was King Cyrus II. King Cyrus II. Uh, he was a great king. That's why he's known as Cyrus the Great. He started his uh, career as a king. He became king in 559, 559 BC. And he ruled up to 530 BC. 530 BC. And in 539, he and his uh, uncle together, Darius the Mede, defeated Babylon and took Babylon. So, uh, Medes and Persians became the rulers of the whole world at that time. So after the death of King Cyrus, his son, known as Cambyses, Cambyses ruled from 530 BC up to 522. Up to 522, though Cyrus gave the permission, he gave the donation, they started the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. But the local people, the Samaritans, they hindered Saturn used the Samaritans to stop the construction work. They complained to the king saying, Oh king, don't permit these people because they are rebellious people. They are very uh, notorious people. They are threat to the king. Don't allow these people. Check the history of these people. They wrote. Why? Because when they started constructing, laying, laying the foundation, the local Samaritans came, the leaders, and said, Oh, we are so happy. You came back. You started constructing. We are also worshipping your God in your absence. So we want to join you to construct the temple. The Jewish people said, Jerubabel and Joshua and other leaders, we have nothing to do with you. We have nothing to do with you. We will not allow you. We will do it by ourselves. Maybe they could have taken some help from them. Okay? So, Satan used the Samaritans 
to hinder the work so they complain then uh, for at least 15 years the temple construction could not proceed though they started the foundation and all they could not continue till the death of Cambyses the son of uh, Cyrus the great now maybe we have to learn a lesson he sat and using you as his agent as a stumbling block for God's evangelism in your village. As Satan using you as his agent to abstract God's evangelism in that city or in that uh, town where you live. Are you a stumbling block? Are you an agent of Satan so that God's work should not uh, progress? Or are you God's agent like Ezra or like uh, uh, Jerubabel? In promoting God's work, promoting God's temple, or let us say there are some places the church is being constructed, but it is they're not able to complete because some of the local people only they are hindering, they are causing problems for the construction of that church building. Are you also one of those agents of Satan, not allowing the church construction in your village or in your street? You have to learn a lesson. Because if we do that, uh, surely we have to give an account to God. We cannot escape God's punishment because you are becoming an agent of Satan as a stumbling block. Do everything possible to help God's evangelism to proceed and progress. And do everything possible for that church building to be constructed and finished so that people can uh, worship and be saved. Then the third king, Darius I, the Persian, he was the son-in-law of uh, King Cyrus. He ruled from 522 BC up to 486 BC. During his time, again, the temple construction was given permission. Then temple was constructed by about 515 or 516 BC in his time the temple second temple was constructed so then after him another king is known as Xerxes I Xerxes I he also has another uh, name called Ahasuerus uh, this king was the husband of uh, Queen Esther he married Queen Esther he ruled uh, from 485 BC up to 465 BC, about 20 years he ruled, up to 465 BC he ruled. Then uh, his son later, his son later, Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes won from 465 to 424 BC, 465 BC up to 4. 24 BC. During his time, Artaxerxes, then the permission was given to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. I want you to remember, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. For this cause, he sent Ezra as the leader, Artaxerxes, the son of King Xerxes I or uh, uh, Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus II. Uh, because in Daniel chapter 9 also, Darius the Mede, his father's name also the same name, Ahasuerus. That is Ahasuerus I, that he was a, a king of Mede. But Esther's husband was a Persian, also the same name, uh, Ahasuerus. And he also he has another name, historians tell us that, Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S. That's why now... Uh, now, regarding Ezra, now, this is the second batch which returned to Jerusalem. First uh, return or first uh, restoration or uh, first batch went in about 536 BC in the days of Prophet Daniel and King Cyrus under the leadership of Jerubabel and also spiritual leader Joshua the high priest. Now, this is the second batch. Now, going to Jerusalem in the time of King Artaxerxes, which means between these two batches, there is a gap at least of 
80 years, 80 to 85 years gap. So now Ezra was a, a very shrewd and very knowledgeable, a good scribe. You can read about him in Ezra chapter 7 verse, verses 1 to 10 and also Ezra chapter 8 1 to 14 and now Ezra worked Ezra worked as the scribe for King Artaxerxes that's why King Artaxerxes had a very very good opinion confidence in Ezra he had trust in Ezra maybe you have to learn the spiritual lesson also wherever you work whether it is a government job or a private job or your own uh, or working for some uh, 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 some industry, wherever you work, we need to work hard, faithfully and you have to win the confidence of those leaders for whom you work. Then God's name will be glorified. See, though this man uh, Ezra worked as a scribe that means writing all the uh, information, what happened, all the events and all of that. Then he won the confidence of the king. In fact, it looks because of the association of the uh, king and this Ezra with the king, working for the king, whenever he got an opportunity and looks as though he told about his God. That's why this artist access also seems to be, be uh, converted or uh, became a believer in the God of heaven. You can, we can read that one in Ezra chapter 7. So in uh, 457 BC, in 457 BC, this king Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes, now gave the decree, gave that uh, uh, royal decree, the permission, and for people who are willing to go, you can go back to Jerusalem. Now to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem city. I want you to notice one thing. The first batch went and constructed the temple. Though it got delayed for 15 years because of Saturn hindered it. But now this second batch is going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem under the leadership. King appointed Ezra gave this permission to Ezra as the leader to take uh, his people. Then uh, how many people went? And we have the information in book of Ezra, 1500 men went along with uh, Ezra, the second batch, which went in 457 BC. And their children, their wives, so we can say approximately about five to 6,000 people. First batch 50,000, the second batch about five to six uh, uh, thousand people, they went. What did uh, Ezra do? Then uh, now we have to read this one in Ezra chapter 10 verses, sorry, Ezra chapter 7 verses 1 to 10 about the command of the king uh, Artaxerxes uh, to go and beautify the temple as well as to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem because all the walls also were destroyed by Babylonian army in 586 BC under King Nebuchadnezzar. But now they are going to rebuild the walls also. Now, this is important because this is the starting point. This date, 457 BC is an important date for the starting point of 2300 days prophecy of Daniel 8.14. And... Uh, now Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 which says now king chose Ezra to send the second group of people, second batch. King uh, Artisarex, Artisarex chose uh, Ezra. Now uh, according to Ezra chapter 7 verse 10 Ezra had prepared his heart prepared his heart to seek the Lord and His law. Maybe you have to learn a lesson. Are we also preparing our heart to seek the Lord and to follow His laws, to follow His word, the Bible? And Ezra did that one. And also, uh, one thing he 
read the word of God. He read the word of God. He read the laws of God. Then he followed them in his uh, life. Then he made up his mind to teach. He made up his mind to teach. And uh, so, now, uh, for example, Ezra chapter 7 verse 11 to 28, we can read the decree which King Artaxerxes made. The decree, the divine decree, uh, sorry, the royal decree. That means King made that order or ordinance. Almost this ordinance, this decree is almost like uh, the decree of Cyrus. Decree of Cyrus. Almost sounds like that. And it says in Ezra chapter 7 verse 27, the Lord put in the heart of King Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes, to beautify the temple and to build the walls of Jerusalem. It is God who put. And uh, so then uh, he also, King said, people should follow the law of God and also the law of the land. Yeah, we have to learn this important lesson also. As God's people, we must follow the laws of God, the commandments of God. At the same time, we also must obey the laws of the land where you live. That means honor the rulers, honor the government, honor the government rules. But if some rules are against your religion, against your uh, faith, then you need not to do it. Otherwise, we have to honor, we have to obey as the loyal citizens. For example, paying tax and whatever the form of tax, we have to be faithful in uh, doing it, not uh, cheating the government. Not cheating the government. We should do. That's why Jesus said, Render unto Caesar which belong to Caesar. Render it unto God which belongs to God. Yes. Whatever belongs to God, the tithe and offering, we have to give it to God. Whatever belongs to the Caesar, that is the rulers, we have to do that one. And uh, so, then, uh, Ezra chapter 7 verse 15. Ezra chapter 7 verse 15. The King Artaxerxes says, the God of Israel in Jerusalem. Okay. God of uh, Israel in Jerusalem. He seems to be uh, having some faith in this God of Israelites. Then Ezra chapter 7 verse 23. Ezra chapter 7 verse 23 says that King Artaxerxes was telling. Now uh, you uh, do everything as God commanded. You do everything for your God in Jerusalem and the temple. And uh, if you don't do that, then uh, God may have his anger on me and my sons. Why should that God be anger or have anger or get angry on me and my sons? Uh, so, which means definitely king was having uh, at least uh, definite faith in this uh, God. In this God. That's why he's uh, saying. Why should God get angry. And uh, on me and my sons. Which means he wanted God's blessing on him. And his sons. So that's why surely. Because of the association with the Ezra. Who worked as his scribe. He came to know about. This true God. His true God. Though we don't have the conclusive proof, he became an outright believer. But he was expressing faith and belief and fear of God in his words in Ezra chapter 7 verse 23. So in 457 BC, the Egyptians revolted against uh, Persian kings at his excess. So in this light, some scholars say, ah, yes, king uh, at his excess gave this permission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to win the favor of Jewish people. But also, this is God's providence because this year should be, or this decree of a king in 457 BC should be the starting point for 2300 days prophecy of Daniel 8.14. That's why God moved his heart to do it. Then, importance of religious education. I know Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 to 10. Definitely now Ezra now made up his mind 
to study God's word. Secondly, to practice it. Thirdly, to teach it, teach it to uh, his Jewish people. We have to do these three steps. One, you study the word of God. Secondly, you practice in your personal life and your family life. Thirdly, you teach it to others. You teach others these important truths so that many people can be blessed. I know as uh, Ezra now grew up and also worked with the heathen king, uh, Artaxerxes, surely he was acquainted. He also studied the wisdom of the wise men of uh, Persia and the knowledge which was available in Persia. He studied also, but he gave more importance to God's knowledge, God's word. Yes, we have to learn a lesson. Today, all of us are going for higher studies, college and university studies, getting higher degrees. And the colleges and universities uh, can give us all the knowledge of the world. But the knowledge of the world cannot give us salvation. That can give you only a job. That job is only for about maybe 30, 35 years if you live that long. Then after that, this knowledge is useless. When you die, that degree, doctoral degree or master's degree is no use. The day I die, that my doctoral degree is no use for anyone. But the religious knowledge, the knowledge of the word, word of God. That's why Ezra gave more importance to God's word. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. So he sought the Lord to study his laws and to follow them. We need to do that one in these last days. Spend more time because Jesus is coming soon. Spend more time with the word of God, reading and learning and prayer. And practice those uh, principles of God's word in your life. Whatever you're learning from God's word, the Bible, you practice it. But don't keep it with you only. Share it with others around. Your colleagues and also maybe uh, your business partners or... Uh, your uh, co-workers in that school, wherever you work, share it with them. Share it with the people around you, your neighbors, so that they can also be blessed and be saved. Because Jesus is coming. That's why, in conclusion, the prophecy which was predicted, see how it happened, how it fulfilled, accurately, no failure. 70 years, Yes, they were there 70 years as the captives. Then deliverance, restoration. Yes, it happened. The heathen king gave decree and say, you can go back. Likewise, the prophecies about second coming are, at, are now fast fulfilling. Now, the major uh, prophecy to be fulfilled is that uh, forcing everybody, forcing everybody uh, to worship forcing everybody to worship on that particular day, Sunday. And uh, now, persecution for God's people. Then seven last plagues. Then second coming. Only few prophecies left now. They will fulfill all the other prophecies is finished. Jesus will come. He will take us to heaven. We will be with him throughout the eternity. If it is your desire, that's why making sense of history in the time of Jerubbabel and uh, Ezra. Today we can uh, glean some meaning to us and say, yes, when God says something in his word, the prophecy, it will surely fulfill, it will not fail. So prophecies are fulfilling. Jesus is coming. We have to get ready to meet the Lord in the air so that we can go home to be with him. If it is your desire, if it is your dis uh, decision, then pause with me for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness to learn spiritual lessons from books of Ezra and Nehemiah these three months. Bless each person who is watching and bless their families, bless their congregations so that we will understand the prophecies will not fail. They will fulfill. You will come soon and take us home. Until that time, keep us faithful and loyal to you. God bless 
each person who is sharing with their families, with their friends, with their community, with their congregation. And online also some of them are sharing. Bless them, Lord. Bless each one of us to grow together. Lord, help us to learn your word. Help us to practice your word in our lives. Help us to share your word with others. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Because I pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen. I want to thank you, my brothers and sisters. God be with you until we meet again next week in the second Bible study lesson. And let God's peace and his blessing be upon each one of us and our families. God bless you.